Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, Sunday, February 10th, 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Wonderful to be with you as always this week in prophecy. Let us begin as we often, if not usually do, in the Middle East. There has been a significant shift in focus of events in the Middle East this week in prophecy. What had largely been concentrated on Syria has now moved westward, as we suspected some time ago, into Lebanon and the Mediterranean basin, the Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean. What has happened this week in prophecy is of a significance prophetically as well as strategically that should not be underestimated or downplayed. Following the elections in Lebanon, the pace of events has gained a very rapid momentum with statements by Mr. Putin's government in Russia and also a visit by the Iranian foreign minister to Beirut as well as the public declarations by Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah. Let's begin looking at these things. The Western-backed coalition government of the Hariri regime found itself in a very precarious state with even Christian President Ayun making pro-Hezbollah statements. Hezbollah became indispensable to forming a coalition government. Now we have to understand what has happened in Lebanon. With the fragmentation of the French Empire after the First World War, it was to be a situation where Syria would be predominantly Alawite and other Islamic communities having their state. Alawite being a sect of Shia as well as the Sunni population. The Christian population was largely concentrated in smaller numbers around Damascus and especially in Aleppo in the north in the area on the Mediterranean coast between Lebanon and Turkey in Aleppo. But Lebanon was to be a de facto predominantly Christian Arab state. Now by Christian I don't mean born again. Evangelicals have never been anything more than a small number of people among indigenous Middle Eastern Christians. How, however, they have existed in the Assyrian community and still do in the Assyrian diaspora in countries such as the United States and in Australia. There are Aramaic-speaking Pentecostals and other evangelicals from Iraq, from Syria. But Lebanon was dominated largely by Maronites, an Eastern Rite of the Roman Catholic Church and certain Eastern Orthodox and Byzantian churches that are descendants of the old Byzantine Empire who lived under the French. Thus, this government of Lebanon was to safeguard the position and security of Arab Christians. It was the only Arab Christian state, although it was not officially and constitutionally a religious state of Christians or of Roman Catholics or of Eastern Orthodox, it was understood to be a demographically Christian enclave within the Arab world and within the Levant. That began to change radically after the 1960s particularly. There was an effort for a takeover of Lebanon in the 1950s when the American President Eisenhower actually landed U.S. Marines to prevent this from happening. Fast forward to the present day. Hezbollah is now a full coalition partner. Hariri and Ayun have no option but to pander to Hezbollah. And Hezbollah, of course, is on the leash of Tehran, of Iran. This week in prophecy, Hassan Nasrallah has stated that Hezbollah alone has the rocket capacity to strike any target in Israel. And he has publicly announced that he will stand with Iran in any conflict between Israel and Iran. Thus you have a theater of operations that Israel is facing extending from the Mediterranean in the north 
from Lebanon through into the areas controlled by the Assad regime with the backing of Russia into Syria and looking very much to Iran. It is interrupted by the American back presence still somewhat in Iraq. Nonetheless, Iran is now the player. Iran is calling most of the shots in Lebanon, as we've been warning about for some weeks. But this week in prophecy, it was formalized and crystallized, both by Nasrallah's own remarks, but by the arrival of Jafad Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, who is in Beirut for talks, negotiations on Iranian military aid to Lebanon. Now, again, this underscores the desperation of Iran to gain a strategic hand. It can only play this game so long for a combination of reasons, one of which is the gutting of much of its economy by the American sanctions under President Trump. It is increasingly expensive for them to fund military expansion. At the same time, oil prices are relatively low, and at the same time, international sanctions and embargoes have affected its oil trade and its international position economically. This has caused very serious levels of double-digit and perhaps approaching triple-digit inflation before very long inside of Iran itself. How long they can continue doing this is a question. But the question that emerges from the question is, will the economic crisis in Iran precipitate a strategic conflict? Very often when countries that are dictatorial are in trouble ex internally, they look for an external enemy or military conflict. There have been many instances of this historically. We saw it, of course, in the Cultural Revolution with Mao Zedong in China, where in order to bring a national cohesion in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution with Zhou Enlai, Chinese communist forces entered into military conflict along the Amur River with the Soviet military forces in an armed conflict between Russia and China. We saw this, of course, with the Galtieri regime in Argentina and the seizing of the Falklands Islands. When dictatorial governments are in trouble domestically, as Samuel Johnson said, patriotism becomes the last refuge of scoundrels. They engineer an external crisis to consolidate a national sense of unity and cohesion that wouldn't be there otherwise, especially when political and social fragmentation is being precipitated by economic crisis. The internal economic crisis, and it is reaching crisis proportions inside of Iran, cannot be separated from Iranian strategic moves externally, and particularly in Syria and in Lebanon. Thus, the Iranian foreign minister this week in prophecy came to Iran at the same time of Nasrallah's remarks and the remarks of Lebanese President Ayoun. This puts Israel in a very, very precarious situation. This week in prophecy, however, Benjamin Netanyahu was to meet again with Vladimir Putin. And it was anticipation on the precipice of this state visit that the Russian ambassador to Lebanon, Alexander Zosriken, accused the United States of engineering a political and strategic crisis in Lebanon in order to generate confrontation between Hezbollah and Israel. What is the underlying factor in this? Why the Russian as well as Iranian involvement? For some time we've been warning that due to fracking in the United States, the United States has become the world's number one oil producer in terms of how many barrels per day. Now, 
well over 10 million. It is doing this at a time when Iranian and Venezuelan production is at a lull and Saudi Arabia is static. Formerly, the largest producer of oil had been Russia. Now Russia is playing second fiddle, but it is not only oil. It is natural gas. Although it is only marginal at this point, Central and Eastern European economies have begun importing liquid gas from the United States. The United States is not only the largest oil producer, it is the largest natural gas producer and a net exporter, second only to the Emirates. This has created a problem for Russia. It no longer is number one in oil, but it is certainly not in the same position it was in Eastern Europe controlling the European natural gas market. What will Russia do? Russia is attempting to make a play in league with Syria and now Lebanon to tap into the Leviathan resources of natural gas under the Mediterranean that up till now, being off the coast of Galilee and Lebanon, due to horizontal drilling technologies and other advanced technologies for tapping into natural gas, that is largely American technology, and capital investment from the United States, Israel, in some league with the United States, both technologically and financially, has the upper hand in cooperation with Cyprus and Greece, particularly Cyprus. This is one faction. Now Russia comes into play looking to bolster its share of market control of natural gas that again is being not exactly eradicated but certainly reduced to a second-class status in contrast to what it had been once more due to the hyper-production of natural gas in the United States, which is now reaching export markets. Even on the doorstep of Russia itself in the former Warsaw Pact nations. This greatly, greatly disturbs Mr. Putin that countries in the former Warsaw Pact, such as Poland, are buying any natural gas in the form of liquid gas from the United States. He needs to find alternative sources because Russia is being outproduced. It no longer is number one. Now, again, this fits into the overall equation that we've mentioned several times. Because of fracking of oil in the United States, what is happening in Iran as a result of the American sanctions and embargoes and what is happening in Venezuela, having the largest proven reserves, is not affecting overall oil prices significantly to the advantage of Russia. Again, Russia is struggling financially. But it is not just oil. Now natural gas has become the active factor in the equation. It has always been looming on the horizon. But what is driving this change in Russian activity, diplomatically and strategically, into Lebanon now, in league with Iran and the Assad government, is undoubtedly the Leviathan natural gas resource fields. Where you have the interests of Israel, in some partnership with the U.S., Cyprus, and to a limited degree, Greece, having the upper hand in tapping into those resources from the south. But now, obviously, other countries, not Lebanon itself, it does not have the capital or technological resource, but Russia to attempt to tap in to the Leviathan fields. There is an economic engine driving these strategic changes. 
Nasrallah is obviously more interested in Islamic radicalism than he is in economics. The same would to a degree be true of the mullahs in Iran. But Russia, it is a matter of economic opportunism. Thus, the economic factor of natural gas has, as we've been predicting what happened, become an active factor, a recognizable factor in the Russian strategy in the Middle East, now extending beyond Syria into Lebanon and the Levant, this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, while most people expected the American presence to recede in Syria, following the announcements of the Trump administration that the United States would begin systematically withdrawing its troops as ISIS was defeated. Much of the world was taken by surprise by a major offensive launched this week in prophecy by American-backed Kurdish forces with American Marines supplying air-to-ground support and major heavy artillery support of the Kurds against ISIS positions. However, this was done close, fairly close, to the area of Syria of interest to Turkey and to the Erdogan regime. It was taking place in two villages near Del Iz Azor, where the leader of ISIS, the surviving major leader, Abu Bakir al-Baghdadi, fled from the Kurdish forces and from the American Marine um, and, and from the American Marine aerial attacks. This is important. The close air to ground operations of fighter aircraft show that it was not simply a bombing type mission, which would have normally been carried out either by carrier-based naval aircraft or by the U.S. Air Force. But it was done by the United States Marines whose air capacity is focused on supporting ground troops. It must have been quite intensive, especially given the fact it was carried out in concert with artillery bombardment. It is strategically, I'm sorry, it is tactically somewhat complicated to bring fighter aircraft and possibly Apache helicopters into play into an area simultaneously undergoing artillery bombardment by 155 millimeter howitzers. Nonetheless, it took place this week and it obviously has had an impact on what remains of ISIS with their leader fleeing. This, however, has not been what is most important. What is most important is the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, were always backed by the United States and worked in league with American military advisors and the United States Marines. But the YPK, the nemesis of Turkey, was the other faction. You actually had an operational tactical cooperation between the USA and the YPK in Syria against ISIS. This would have worked to the irritation of Erdogan and the Turkish regime, who see YPK as a terrorist organization that is a threat to Turkish nationalist interests and to Kurdish separatist interests, even inside of Turkey itself. This demonstrates that the Trump regime, while playing a diplomatic card, is not prevented from playing a tactical card. In diplomacy, as in anything else, don't just listen to what people say. Watch what people do. And whatever rapprochements have taken place between the Trump administration and the Turkish government, it was not the placation some observers thought, given the fact that the United States has now acted in concert with the YPK 
how be it against ISIS. Any cooperation with the YPK would greatly, greatly disturb, annoy, agitate the Erdogan regime of Turkey. And it took place this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Netanyahu government in Israel has announced it was going to begin deducting directly from the international aid budget filtered through Israel into the Palestinian Authority, equivalent sums used by the Palestinian Authority to effectively reward the families of terrorists killed in terrorist action against Israel. In other words, if you are going to pay compensation to the families of terrorists who kill Israelis, that amount of compensation will be deducted from your budget. This was being done indirectly until now. But as of this week in prophecy, it is going to be done directly. At the same time, American Hercules aircraft, U.S. Air Force planes have been arriving at the Israeli base of Hatzor, a major Israeli Air Force base in central Israel. Hundreds of American military personnel, many of them specialized in operations management, have been deployed in Israel in these joint exercises, which are generally annual. But they are taking place at the same time of the stepped up Russian and Iranian activity in Lebanon and in Syria. This week in prophecy. So once again, the United States has been directly involved in combat in Syria. At the same time, these events are unfolding in Lebanon, while the United States and Israel are engaged in joint operations of a planning nature in terms of exercises. The exercises, again, are an annual ritual. But the fact that they're taking place at the same time as these other events does send a signal to the Assad regime and to Russia and to Lebanon that the United States is prepared to continue to stand by Israel in terms of airlift once again. These massive airlifts that commenced in 1973 have never been repeated to the same level they were then during the Yom Kippur War. But, <coughs> but regular exercises preparing for such massive airlifts have taken place. In other words, it is something the United States has done and can do again, and they practice for on a regular basis. It is something the United States has done on a massive scale and practiced to do again annually and they've been practicing this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, it was disclosed in Great Britain by the media that in a joint operation between the Israeli Mossad, the American Central Intelligence Agency, and the British MI6, all three intelligence agencies working in cooperation, that an Iranian nuclear scientist was smuggled into Great Britain and then to the United States. It took place through a complicated series of events that saw one of the Balkan countries allowing visitors to come from Iran without a visa. At the same time, refugees from Syria were arriving in Western Europe, some coming to Britain in significant enough numbers that was used as a cover to get the scientist into Britain, probably with his family. He was undoubtedly debriefed by the Americans, the British, and the Israelis concerning Iranian plans for nuclear weapons development, as is obviously their long-term goal. He becomes an intelligence asset. Again, so much of what happens in the Middle East is not what we read about, but the things that we usually don't read about. 
but we do see an effort by the Israelis and the Americans and the British to siphon nuclear scientists involved in potential weapons production and the enrichment of weapons grade plutonium, uranium inside of Iran. There's been more of this activity that has been publicly disclosed, obviously, because of the methodology and the networks by which these scientists were taken from Iran and persuaded to leave are still of some value operationally. Much has not been disclosed, but enough has been disclosed to tell us it's happening. And it happened this week in Prophecy. This week in Prophecy, a statement was released by the Vatican quoting Pope Francis. The statement translated into English essentially states that the papacy is seeing the Bible. And now, in Roman Catholic terms, the Bible is essentially the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, translated into other languages. And approved Roman Catholic translations, such as the Dewey edition or the uh, Jerusalem Bible. As being obsolete, the Pope is confronting the problem of declining mass attendance, declining interest in Roman Catholicism in Catholic countries, and declining numbers of so-called religious vocations. As part and parcel of his reasoning, he believes the scripture as it exists is outdated and has begun experimenting with the idea of replacing it with something provisionally called Biblia 2000. This shows the mindset of Roman Catholicism that is ironically also adopted by liberal Protestant higher criticism. It says the following in effect, the church wrote the Bible, the church can rewrite it. It becomes the word of the institutionalized religious establishment not the word of the Lord that is in their thinking. There is good reason why the Roman Catholic Church is concerned with its decline. As we pointed out in what had been the most Catholic country in Western Europe, that up until one generation ago was the only country in the Western world that produced more clergy than it needed for its own domestic operations and ministry was the Republic of Ireland. With the recent votes to change abortion, the Roman Catholic Church had no political or social influence in the vote anymore, absolutely none, its moral credibility being too diminished by pedophilia and clerical scandals reaching up into its hierarchy. This is Ireland. As we've been pointing out, much has been happening in Ireland of a very, very negative nature. The activities of the Irish senator from the dial, Francis Black, to bring boycott and disinvestment laws into legislation in the Republic of Ireland, where people can be arrested and criminally prosecuted for engaging in commerce with any Israeli industry that has a manufacturing base in the West Bank. The entire thinking of Irish republicanism concerning Israel is in fact absurd, but it was taking place this week in prophecy. Ireland has gone from bad to worse, as we've said, in terms of its abortion legislation, in terms of its same-sex marriage legislation, and now in terms of its boycott and disinvestment of Israel legislation. Seven Roman Catholic churches were effectively burned to the ground in Gaza by Hamas and by individual supportive of Hamas in violent anti-Roman Catholic demonstrations less than 10 years ago. The plight of Roman Catholics in countries with Arya, well, I'm sorry, with in countries with Sharia, Islamic law, 
has not been easy for Roman Catholic people, particularly the Roman Catholics in Iraq. Yet this is popularly ignored by the Roman Catholic hierarchy and it's ignored by the largely Roman Catholic population of the Republic of Ireland who just don't care anymore. They misidentify the cause of Irish Republicanism with Palestinian nationalism in what is not only historical revisionism, but something bordering on gross stupidity. The provisional IRA, not to be confused with the historical IRA of Michael Collins in the early part of the 20th century, cooperated in arms procurement and in terrorist training with radical Islamic interests and with the government of Libya under Gaddafi. You can see the murals in the Catholic areas of Belfast up Fall Road and in Anderson Town being anti-Israel, pro-radical Palestinian. This has been the policies of Jerry Adams and the late Sean McGuinness. But it overlooks the reality. Irish Republicanism says... British Protestants are welcome to live in Northern Ireland, but not divided into a British state. It must be a continuous Irish state, a united Ireland, where British citizens living there have the option of either accepting Irish citizenship or dual national status, or living there as expatriates with control in their own community, but the border must come down, there must be one, Ireland. Now this is being highlighted very much this week in prophecy, again, by the Brexit negotiations of a soft Brexit, a hard Brexit, what will become of the Irish border between Northern and Southern Ireland with Brexit concerning Great Britain. Be that as it may, logically and historically, Irish Republicans should side with the Israelis because it's the same kind of situation. The Israelis are the indigenous people of the West Bank, much the same as Irish people are the indigenous people of the six counties of Ulster, Northern Ireland. The equivalent of the British presence the Unionists in Northern Ireland are the Palestinians. They are the foreigners who occupy the land of the indigenous people. Logically and rationally, on that basis, Irish nationalists and Irish Republicans should be sympathetic to Israel. Both are the indigenous people. Both have tried to resurrect their ancient language. Irish Gaelic and Hebrew. Both fought the British for their independence. And both see themselves in a minority in their own land in an artificially constructed territorial region, be it the West Bank or Ulster. Ironically, it is the Protestant Unionists who are pro-Israel. There is no logic or rationality to what Irish Republicanism and Irish nationalism are doing in their anti-Israel sentiments. Overlooking the fact that Israel has the best human rights record in the Middle East and that the persecution of their co-religionists in the Middle East is not being done by Jews or Israelis, it's being done by radical Muslims. This is the stupidity of Francis Black and of her political supporters in the Irish Republic. Possibly two-thirds of the Irish voters are pro-Palestinian, not realizing that the Palestinians are to Israel what the British are to them. There's no logic. It is a, in part, demonically induced delusion that is removed from historical reality. But it was reaching its apex this week in prophecy in the Republic of Ireland. 
I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee without any doubt. The economic and political triumphs being seen by the Trump administration in the United States despite the opposition from left-wing academia and the mainstream media and the extremely hostile Democratic Party increasingly being taken over by the radical left and by socialists is undoubtedly God's hand of blessing on the Trump administration for blessing Israel. It is on the basis of Genesis 12, 1 to 3, that we see economic calamity and political catastrophe coming to the Republic of Ireland. It may be related to Brexit because they have touched the apple of God's eye and unjustly cursed Israel. But it's taking place this week in prophecy. Now, bear in mind, my own mother's family is from Donegal and Cork. I uh, am half Irish American. I take no delight in saying these things. And I don't say them because my wife and my children are Israeli. I say them because of what God says in his word. Jesus made it clear. The Jews would be back in their ancient land. Zechariah 12, 1 to 10, Matthew 23, 39 and 40, Luke 21, 24. But the word of God has never meant very much among Roman Catholics anyway. It is not only in Ireland, however, we are seeing this effect. This week in prophecy, Benjamin Netanyahu flew to Brazil to attend the inauguration of the new Brazilian president, a country that has been immersed in economic chaos with all matter of scandal, including financial and political scandal that is a national quagmire. The growth of the evangelical population in Latin America and conspicuously in Brazil that has seen nearly 30% of the Roman Catholic population, by some estimates more, turn from Roman Catholicism to evangelicism, particularly Pentecostalism, over the last 40 to 45 years has now begun to have political ramifications. We now have a president of Brazil who is pro-evangelical, who was elected with the support of the evangelical vote, much the same as you have in the United States. He has announced his intention to move the embassy of Brazil from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The fact that you have a pro-evangelical president in what has been the demographically largest Roman Catholic country in the world, that he's elected with the backing of an organized bloc as an evangelical vote, much the same as you have in the United States, is an unreported and underrecognized shockwave that is not going unnoticed in the Vatican. The Vatican equates its demographic decline and its moral decline and its decline in popularity because of the pedophilia that is rife throughout Latin America. And that the present Pope as a Latin American is well aware of in terms of its consequences demographically, economically, and politically. The Roman Catholic Church is being shaken in Brazil. Mr. Netanyahu went there for the inauguration. Brazil will now imitate the United States under the evangelical influence relocating its embassy to Jerusalem. I would anticipate some improvement in the situation in Brazil because of God's blessing as a result. Again, I'm not saying it's a cause and effect <coughs> situation all the time, but the principle will always apply. God will bless those who bless and curse those who curse. We're talking here of the largest Roman Catholic country in the world demographically. 
this week in prophecy. Finally, this week in prophecy, it was announced in Israel by certain political factions active in the National Coalition, including Avador Lieberman's people, that if Benjamin Netanyahu is indicted, that he will enter into a plea bargain arrangement where he will resign. Now, as we've said for some time, when the political left loses an election, the trend has become to react legally with the political use or misuse of the judiciary. We see this in the United States with the bogus Mueller investigations, but we also see it taking place in Israel. Quite remarkable. You can't win at the ballot box, try to win in court with politically trumped up charges. I'm not saying that Mr. Netanyahu is perfect or that he and his wife have not made mistakes. What I am saying, though, is the opposition is not legally motivated. It's politically motivated. And he is not guilty of the criminal acts, anything on the scale warranting a criminal indictment and prosecution. If that evidence was there, it would have come to light by now. Much the same as the Mueller investigations in the United States. That, of course, is an editorial comment. It is only my opinion. Our purpose is to look at the events themselves in light of prophecy. As always, Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Israel. He who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Thank you so much for listening. Watch Lebanon now. And continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for Mr. Netanyahu, and for Mr. Trump. Thank you so much. God bless.